Hi everyone, I'm especially excited today because this is the first lecture of our Neural IR block and we're going to take a look at some of the workflows and basic neural re-ranking models. My name is Sebastian and if you have any questions, please feel free to contact me. Today we're looking at two things specifically. First is the re-ranking workflow and its connection to the first stage ranker, including training and evaluation of neural re-ranking models. And then in the second part, we're going to take a look at basic re-ranking models, which don't use transformers. And here we're going to take a look at some of the model stages and then some of the models such as match pyramid and kernel pooling based models um, that have been developed before BERT, as well as the influence of fixed sized vocabularies. Before we start, I think we need to set this lecture in the right context. So today we look at text-based neural models. In learning to rank systems, usually when you run them in production, you can have many different features, such as click count, recency, source quality, etc. And the learning to rank field that works with classical machine learning techniques, such as regression, SVM, or tree-based um, techniques can use those features as well. Plus, increasingly in production at larger companies run those text-based neural models that we also look at. I also have to stress that deploying a re-ranker in production is a huge effort on performance, quality control, version management, changing indices, etc. And we don't uh, look at them today. But what we're going to look at today is neural models for content-based ad hoc retrieval, which means that we only use the text of the query and the document. And this can be thought of as another signal in a bigger learning to rank system. And we mainly use this content-based ad hoc retrieval without other features because the open test collections that we have available don't provide us with more features. And the second disclaimer that the basics that we look at today are not state of the art anymore. So transformer based models surpassed um, those initial, initially proposed simple models in terms of quality. However, we believe that it's still interesting and informative to look at them. And also many of the intuitions now guide our work with transformers. And the basic models are much faster and resource efficient to train. So that's why we also use them in our exercise, which um, could be helpful to have a look at the slides today. And of course the re-ranking workflow is still used with transformer based models if they are used as re-rankers. More about transformer re-ranking, BERT models and dense retrieval is coming in the next lectures. The desired properties of neural IR models are pretty much in line with any other machine learning task. They should be effective, right? So they, if they don't work, then we just wouldn't use them. They need to be fast and scalable. So that's something that maybe differentiates the information retrieval task more from other um, machine learning tasks is that if you do online re-ranking, meaning you re-rank when the user searches for something, you basically have a time budget of 10 to 100 milliseconds for the full query. And potentially your indices are terabytes large. 
of course this can vary um, a lot right so we have also we're also working with a lot of indices that are smaller for more specialized products um, and projects so not everyone is working on a web search engine and then um, in my opinion also a very important point is that those models should be interpretable because search engines filter information so they act as a gate um, to access certain informations for a large number or a potentially large number of people so that means that the reasons for including or excluding certain results should be explainable and it should be analyzable um, if you see that something is not right and with that um, maybe let's do a small um, warning for the exercise especially so neural networks fail silently which means that you can train a neural network for hours and hours and it will produce some results you will get some numbers out of it um, but that doesn't mean that the network learns correctly or that the network produces any meaningful outputs um, and even worse sometimes you have small mistakes in there that just cost you a couple of percentage points of difference in your evaluation metrics but those couple of percentage points could mean the difference between a new state-of-the-art model and something that's kind of in the in the middle of everything right so the neural re-ranking field is very much uh, a wild west at the moment we have a lot of new developments and a lot of an enormous amount of problems is not solved at the moment and we don't know the answers to it and we don't have best practices yet and kind of every research group has their own best practices so it's a little bit different than other research fields that are more mature already um, but i think that also makes the um, research field more uh, exciting so if you want to know more information about what could go wrong with uh, neural network training and how to potentially fix that and find those errors um, you might find that link quite handy let's talk about the workflow so what is actually different for neural um, re-ranking models in comparison to other machine learning tasks neural ir models um, re-rank a candidate list of results so they don't actually create their own index at the moment um, we're going to look at um, indexing features and techniques in a later lecture in this lecture we only focus on the re-ranking part which means that we still depend on an inverted index and a first stage ranker such as bm25 that we learned about in the crash course to produce our candidate list let's say we have a candidate list of a thousand potential documents that come comes out of our first stage ranker here then for those thousand documents we look up the full text in our full text storage and together with the query text each document gets paired with the query text so the neural ir model actually um, has the same interface as classical ranking methods you get the score of a pair of one query and one document and then um, after each pair is scored you just sort um, the pairs by the returned score to for example take the top 10 documents out of the pool of a thousand and only present those top 10 documents to the user And we also have to be aware of how a search engine um, is interacted with so search engines um, have a lot of users um, potentially right um, and those 
users interact with the search engine in two ways. So one way, the search engine delivers users the query results, but users also deliver search engines click data. So they know where a user clicked on. And this can be saved in logs. And then over time, those logs can be accumulated and used to improve the search engine. And here in this picture, we see we start with a couple of users that are sometimes happy and sometimes they're not happy. But over time, we use the clicks as a relevance signal so we can make more users happy down here. And the way we do it is at certain intervals, neural IR models are trained so-called offline and are then swapped out with the actual um, running model. So it's not like the neural IR model continuously learns, but it is a loop that is somewhat asynchronous with the whole process because of course you want to do quality control before actually deploying a neural IR model. All right, let's take a look inside um, a neural ranking model and how um, most of the neural ranking models that we're looking at are built up. So the core part is a so-called matching module. Here we operate on word on the word interaction level. So each word in the query somehow interacts with each word in the document. And in this example here, you can see we have two input sequences, the question and the document. Both get encoded to, for example, with word embeddings. Um, then maybe we have a feature extraction stage here that does some sort of feature extraction or interaction in one of the sequences. And then we match the two sequences together. And after that, we probably have some sort of module that takes this matrix of interactions between every term and condenses it to the relevance score. So as output, we get a single score. As I said, the training is independent from the rest of the search engine. Um, and the training itself is also not dependent on um, a continuous uh, retrieval of something. So we can do this all in batches. Neural IR models are typically trained with triples, um, where you have a pairwise uh, relevant or positive and one non-relevant document or negative um, document. And the way this works is we have two forward passes in our model. So once the pair with the relevant document and once the pair with the non-relevant document. And then in our loss function, we want to maximize the margin of the score between the relevant and the non-relevant document. In PyTorch, this is done with the um, margin ranking loss, um, where we just use that loss function and provide it with both um, results. And PyTorch then generates the computational graph for both paths, so to speak. So that means that all model components are trained end to end. And of course, there are um, other ways to train those models, for example, with a listwise loss. But in this lecture, we're going to keep it simple and only look at the pairwise loss. To best utilize modern GPUs, we train with batches of multiple examples per gradient update. And usually we do it by forming a batch as large as possible that fits into our, so that everything fits into our GPU memory. Typically, this is somewhere between 16 and 128 um, triples. And 
Here we mix different queries together. So we don't have the same query, um, but a diverse uh, set of queries. And depending on the model, we need to create query passage pairs, or we can run each of the three sequences individually through the model, as can be seen here on the left side. We run a backward pass and gradient update per batch, and the sequence um, inputs, they come as a single matrix, as a single tensor. So we need to pad different length inputs to make them all fit into the same tensor, because the tensor always needs the same sequence length for very efficient um, matrix multiplications on top of that. Virtually all collections that we're working with in academia only come with judgments of relevant or false positive selections from other models, but not judgments for truly non-relevant cases. Because it doesn't really make sense to spend annotation resources on annotating completely random pairs, because the probability that those random pairs are non-relevant is quite high. So we somehow we need to tell the model what is non-relevant. So and we don't have information about which passages are non-relevant. But this simple procedure that is very often used to sample non-relevant passages uses the more simpler BM25 retrieval model with an inverted index to get the, for example, top 1000 results per training query, and then randomly selects a few of those results as non-relevant, which of course we could make mistakes in there, but empirically it has been shown that this procedure works very well and produces non-relevant passages that are not completely random because they still provide some signal as there must be at least some lexical overlap um, because BM25 um, works on lexical overlap, but they're mostly non-relevant passages. And a bit of noise is also good, right? So we, um, we don't mind if there's a bit of noise in our training data. More on how we compose batches and how we sample uh, from the index and what that means for dense retrieval comes in future lectures. Even though most of the time non-relevant sampling works pretty straightforward out of the box, we can easily break non-relevant sampling if we make a mistake in our sampling procedure. So too many false negatives, which are actually relevant, confuse the model during training. And one such example is if we have click data as relevance signals, we also potentially know about non-clicked passages. So passages which have been in the result list, but the users skipped over them and did not click on them. And if we now go ahead and sample those non-clicked passages as negatives, we actually break the training. As we can see here on the right-hand side, um, as the validation, as the orange line of our validation uh, result for the trip click collection, where we even use a bird-based model, which should train very well but in the orange case did not train very well. And once we removed those non-clicked passages from our negative sampling procedure and only relied on BM25 negatives shown in the green line, we can see that the model trains much, much better. And it actually, so the, the first validation result actually starts after 
the first 4,000 patches actually basically starts at the best point of the previous orange run, but of course continues much higher than that. And for the loss, we also have multiple choices that we can take. But in practice, usually the choice of the binary relevance loss is not um, very critical. So here we give you two examples. First, we can use a plain margin loss, which is in PyTorch called margin ranking loss, which just pushes the two sc scores from the relevant and non-relevant document away from each other without any activation, without any transformation, just the scores need to get away from each other. And then we can also use the so-called rank net loss, which uses a binary cross entropy on the margin of the two scores and both losses assume binary relevance. A deep dive on non-binary um, loss functions comes in the knowledge distillation lecture. From the training, let's now come to the evaluation part. So um, we score a single tuple of query and document, although we're not evaluating those uh, tuples on their own. No, we are doing a list-based evaluation after we scored all query document pairs, sorted them, and then we apply ranking metrics. Those same ranking metrics we talked about in the evaluation lecture, such as MRR or NDCG at 10. Um, just a reminder, MRR means mean reciprocal rank, where you only look at the first relevant document and stop looking at position 10. So this brings us to a mismatch. We can't really compare a training loss that's based on um, triples or a combination of two pairs and list-based IR evaluation metrics. And in practice, this looks the following. So the training loss is only good for checking at the beginning if the loss goes down, but then the training loss quickly converges to a relatively small number, such as 0.02 or something, and stays roughly at that point, although the IR evaluation metrics continue to improve during a continuous uh, validation of our model, which is very interesting and you should keep that in mind for the exercise. The MS marker data um, kind of looks like that. So we have training triples where um, we have queries and, you, and one relevant and one non-relevant document. And here in this example, you kind of see that um, those training triples are truly um, of a good quality because the relevant is human judged and the non-relevant can be sampled um, randomly from the collection. And that means that the relevant document definitely is relevant and the non-relevant is very probable non-relevant. Although of course, again, we could introduce noise at that stage, but um, it doesn't seem to be that much of an issue. And then for the evaluation, um, we work the following. So we have a document ID and a query ID, and that way we can then um, map the texts of the query and document back to the relevance labels. Now that we've seen examples of how the text looks like, so how humans um, look at the text, we now look at the actual input and output of our neural re-ranking model. And to input, um, we have tensors of word IDs containing each a batch of samples. So a tensor is a multi-dimensional array abstraction. Um, 
and batching means that for efficiency we're not scoring a single pair at a time but we actually pack multiple queries and multiple documents together in a tensor so that on a GPU we can compute them in parallel. And this means that the same dimension um, for all entries uh, needs to be with the same length. So each dimension, you can see that as um, if you look at it in the simplest example, we have a two dimensional array, right? That means that every row and column have to have the same number of entries. Otherwise, you um, could not simply allocate one block of memory and you could not simply index on every um, position that's allowed by, by the um, boundaries of the array. So um, to do that, um, we so-called pad shorter sequences with zeros or a special padding vector um, that even though we have uh, all, almost exclusively we have sequences of different lengths, we pad them to be the same length so that the um, sequence with the maximum length defines the um, size of our tensors and every sequence that's shorter than that gets padded. And for the query tokens, the shape um, is simple. So we have first, uh, the first index defines our batch size and our different um, batch samples. And then the second um, indexable dimension is the query, the maximum query sequence length. And for the document tokens, it's the same, but with the document sequence length. All right, so how do our neural re-ranking models um, work with this input that we give them? Let's take a look. We start with the encoding layer. So it's the starting point for our text process, for any text processing task. And here we take our inputs that we just saw, so the word IDs or the word piece IDs, and we um, convert them to a dense representation. And in information retrieval, it's very important to have word boundaries um, in your model so that you know what, um, when a word starts and when a word ends. Even if we operate on word pieces, it can be quite useful to know which word pieces are in which word. And we can um, know that if we also have an offset vector that tells us when words start and end based on parts of a word. Right, and so the actual implementation or the pre-trained data of an encoding layer is pretty easily swappable. So you can um, evaluate the same information retrieval model with different encoding layers um, and of course, um, you can swap in um, more complex methods of encoding your words. And the encoding layer is usually shared between the query and the document encoding. So that if you get the same word, it also is assigned the same or at least a very similar vector. And similar. Um, so it is assigned the same vector if you, for example, have a simple word embedding, then you will get the same vector. But if you have contextualized representations, you um, will probably not get exactly the same vector, but at least um, if the model works correctly, you will get a very similar vector that's still um, closer to the own word than to others, even though it contains contextual information. So typically, before 2019, this encoding layer indeed was a word embedding. Simple word embedding, nothing else. So you took a pre-trained word to vec or glove word embedding and you fine-tuned it with the rest of the model. But since um, 2019, 
this encoding layer, um, the simple encoding layer, uh, is not state of the art anymore. And state of the art is state of the art encoding layers are based on transformer self attention models, which show very strong results, but are also quite complex. So we're going to look at them in our next lecture. And in this lecture, we cover the basics and start with simple word embeddings only. And even though they're not state of the art anymore, in my opinion, they still have um, a lot of strong benefits. So first and foremost is speed. A simple word embedding is much, much faster than any contextualization because it's just a simple memory lookup on the GPU if you load the word embedding on the GPU. And they are also somewhat interpretable. You have a lot of analysis tools for them and you can reuse them, etc. But after the encoding layer, um, what many uh, neural models um, build upon or the core of them is the so-called match matrix, where um, you go from query and document representations and each representation interacts with each other, um, for example, by using a cosine similarity. So the cosine similarity takes two vectors and produces for two vectors one output value. So when you have um, two lists of vectors that interact with each other, what you get out is an interaction matrix that for each interaction contains exactly one value. And based on uh, those similarities, you can then do more. Um, And the cosine similarity um, to formalize it a bit looks like that. So you um, take the dot product of normalized vectors. Um, and with that, you measure the direction of vectors, but not the magnitude. And technically, you shouldn't say that it is a distance, but it is equivalent to the Euclidean distance of unit vectors. So say cosine similarity, which is here. All right. Um, and the cosine similarity in PyTorch can be implemented as a quite efficient batched matrix multiplication. Because of course, in our pictured example here, we only have one sample. But in reality, um, you need to visualize them another layer but then we have multiple examples at a time. And this looks like that. So you have an input shape of batch dimensions, um, query sequence length, and then embedding dimensions, the same for the document. So you now have three dimensional tensors. And as an output shape, you want to have the batch um, dimension, then the query sequence length and the document sequence length. Um, and which basically says for each combination of query and document, you get one value. And in PyTorch, you can uh, do it like that. Right, and with that, we're going to take a look at our first neural IR model um, called Match Pyramid. And Match Pyramid um, is very much influenced from computer vision models. So what you do is um, you compute the match matrix based on um, word embedding interactions. And on top of that mat match matrix, you apply a set of 2D convolution layers. Um, and this set of convolution layer um, builds up on top of each other. So you have CNNs and then you have dynamic pooling, what we saw in the last lecture as well to take care of the variable length input of the match matrix and create a fixed sized output. Um, what we found is that the architecture and the effectiveness very strongly depends on the configuration. So the model is defined as that 
the number of layers, the sizes, etc. They are all hyperparameters, but the model very strongly depends on a good selection of those hyperparameters. But generally, you said it so that the pooling output becomes gradually smaller, so that it has a pyramid-sized shape, and that's where the name match pyramid comes from. Now, let's take a look at the architecture um, or the flow of the architecture in a visual way. So we start off um, with our word embeddings, the encoding. Then we have a match matrix followed by our set of CNN layers. And each CNN layer produces a number of output matrices with multiple channels. So the convolutional layer extracts local interaction features. And by using a max pooling layer, we only keep the strongest interaction or match signals. And by having different channels in our CNNs, we can learn different interaction patterns. Um, and what Match Pyramid very often learns is to have um, n-grams, such as uh, bigrams and trigrams, um, those create stronger uh, interaction signals than single word matches. And finally, um, after our last CNN layer, a multi-layer feedforward module scores the extracted feature vectors. This is formalized um, as the following. I'm not going to uh, go through the formulas right now, but of course you can pause the video and um, look at the formula yourself. The next um, model we're going to look at is the so-called KNRM model, the kernel-based neural ranking model. And here, um, we are not using any sort of convolution, but um, a very efficient and very um, smart way of counting the amount of different similarities between a query and a document. And the kernel part itself does not have much learnable parameters, only the embedding layer here learns a lot of parameters. And by being um, very simple in the computational complexity, the KNRM model is very fast. So it's definitely by far the fastest model we're talking about today and in this course as a whole. And it has on its own, it has roughly the same effectiveness as Match Pyramid. Right, so again, we have our query and document representations from our encoding layer. Each representation gets um, matched in the match matrix. And then on top of the match matrix, we apply a set of RBF kernel functions. And this set of RBF kernel functions then creates um, a set of matrices that contain the activation of the kernel function, which are then summed up per um, query, no, per document um, dimension and per query dimension, which results in a single value per kernel function, which is then weighted to become the final score. And we just learn the um, weightings of the kernels, but we don't actually learn the kernel functions. Here we take fixed functions. And this can be formalized in the following. So um, first we start with the match matrix and then for each entry in the match matrix mij we apply this kernel function k here and the kernel function um, takes the is a uh, Gaussian kernel function which takes the exponential of the following 
um, formula and then after we get and it results in an activation between um, 0 and 1 and after that each um, each query uh, gets uh, each document term gets summed up so we are left with um, a value per query term then um, those uh, query terms are log normalized which is very important to form a score per kernel and then the kernel is summed up all right so i talked a lot about kernels and activation functions and it might it's it's very hard to just visualize um that intuitively without seeing how this um Gaussian kernel function looks like. So here is one. The thing is, we start off with cosine similarities, and those cosine similarities are in the range of 1 to minus 1. And they can't be outside that range. So we only have to look at the range from 1 to minus 1. And you can view this plot here as the input of the function, the cosine similarity, is on the x-axis. So if we have a cosine similarity of let's say 1, we get roughly an activation of 0 0.6. And if we have a cosine similarity of 0 0.9 in this kernel function, we get a full activation of 1. So we can never get a higher activation than 1. And if the cosine similarity is not in the, our range around 0 0.9 here, this um, particular case will not be activated then. That's why we have multiple kernels. So here, um, typically for KNRM, we have something like 10 kernels that overlap each other. Um, and they are able to count um, the number of times a cosine similarity value is inside their kernel range if you sum up the activations after the kernels. And as you can see, that's also why we don't learn the kernel activations on their own because um, they are evenly spaced out and they cover the whole range. Um, of our potential uh, cosine similarities. Additionally, KNRM also defines an exact match kernel that only um, looks at cosine similarities of one. And it can do that because it only uses word embeddings that produce the same vector for each um, same occurrence of a word. Last year, I actually re-implemented all those neural IR models I'm showing you today. And so I uh, can report you some interesting <laughs> findings that I had. So, a sh so to speak, a short tale about reproducibility and how hard it can be to actually achieve what the original paper laid out because of um, missing details or confusion in what to do exactly. And that's why details matter. So here you can see um, two heat maps of the output of um, of the output of our evaluation of a KNRM of two KNRM runs. So on the x-axis um, horizontally you can see the evaluation at different cutoffs so how much documents we actually evaluate until so at k from 1 to 100 and then um, vertically we can see the training time coming from top down so 
um, lower means we are later in the training time. And on the left side, you can clearly see that the model does not learn anything because the more documents you add, the worse it gets. And the best MRR score is very poor. So it stays the same as our initial BM25, um, which of course is not good. So if we can't have a neural model that produces better scores than our um, simplest baseline, um, that's a bad sign. But on the right side, we see a run where we actually learn to incorporate more and more documents and get better results from that the longer we train. So we can see that the model actually starts to learn, which is also visible with the best MRR score that we reach in the end. So what's the difference? Well, let's have a look. The difference is quite small. The difference is a single added one. Namely, we just saw that the um, document activations before the, they get summed up to the query uh, on the query dimension are normalized with a log. And if you now um, take a log of one plus um, the value instead of uh, just the log, it doesn't learn anything. And the problem now is there is open source code available for both versions, which of course makes it hard to see um, what to do here. And at first it might seem counterintuitive because if you only use the log, you get negative values if your um, soft term frequency here is smaller than one. But um, our best educated guess is that the log um, on its own acts as a regularization. And if you don't um, have a lot of occurrences of a cosine similarity, it actually affects the score negatively. Um, and you can basically ignore single occurrences as noise and only um, score documents that are um, have more matches than that. The next model um, that I want to show you today is the Confcanor M model, which is a um, great extension of the KNRM model and introduces um, convolutional neural networks into the process. Namely, it cross matches n-gram representation and then applies the kernel pooling from KNRM, and which in theory allows to match convolutional neural networks with deep learning. Um, and the it, it plays with the fact that n-grams and term proximity are very important in information retrieval. And it's not feasible to create a vocabulary with all possible n-grams. The Confcanor M model is the most effective model highlighted today. And only next week we will see, um, we will basically take the next step towards the current state of the art. Let's recall from the previous lecture on sequence modeling in NLP how we can create word n-grams with one-dimensional CNNs, right? So we start again with one word embedding per word, and then we run a one-dimensional CNN with a sliding window across our sequence to create n-gram representations. And this is exactly what the confcanor M model is doing. So here in the encoding layer, you can see that 
before um, we do any sort of matching, each um, sequence is run through CNNs. And um, we have CNNs of multiple window sizes. So we have a CNN with size 2, a CNN with size 3, and also a CNN with size 1 to basically filter um, single matches down to the same dimension um, so that we can cross match them all together. And KNRM creates a single match matrix for every combination. So you match um, single words with uh, bigrams, with trigrams, you match bigrams with each other, you match bigrams and trigrams and so on. And then the then uh, ConfigKNRM applies KNRM on top of the match matrix and concatenates all the different um, n-grand combination results, weights them together to form the final score. Formalized ConfigKNRM looks like this. So we basically apply a 1D CNN on our encoding, um, different 1D CNNs on our encoding. And what we do is we add another dimension um, to our kernel tensors, right? So we um, operate on more dimensions here, but the basic layout stays the same. We apply the matching for each combination. And as I just said, KNRM kernels basically stay the same. Other models, other early neural IR models include Packer, which applies multiple 2D convolutional layers on top of the match matrix, um, which is a little bit different than Match Pyramid does it. Um, then we have the Duet model, which models individual word matches and also creates a single vector per document and query and takes the similarity there and then combines both paths at the end. And the, I would say, foundational yet not effective neural re-ranking model is the DRMM model. So it uses hard histograms of similarities and because of that, the histograms are not differentiable anymore and the embedding is not updated, which makes this model absolutely not effective, but the general ideas it presented um, resonate through all our models until today. All right, we're almost done with this lecture, but I'm not letting you off the hook just now. Now we're going to take a look at um, some deeper evaluation, especially on the effect of low frequency terms on the neural IR models I just showed you. So what is uh, the general context of this work? Infrequent terms carry a lot of relevance information in information retrieval. Um, and if you search for an infrequent term, you're very likely um, that this term um, contains the most impact on your search query if you search for multiple words plus the infrequent term. But if we use neural IR models with a fixed vocabulary, um, then those infrequent terms are removed mainly as a concession to efficiency and memory requirements, but that also means that the neural IR model doesn't see removed terms. And um, a fixed vocabulary for all terms wouldn't scale. And even so, even if you would have a fixed vocabulary for all terms, you could still have very little training data for those terms or uh, unseen query terms that are again out of your vocabulary. And we presented this work in 2019 uh, at SIGIR.
we have two contributions here. We show that the importance of covering all terms of a collection is uh, paramount to uh, good model results. And um, we are the first to, to analyze this re-ranking threshold as a great tool for diagnostics to see if a model gets better the more documents you actually re-rank. And if a model doesn't perform well, well, then more re-ranking documents decrease the effectiveness. And then the second part is that we also used fast text to strongly increase the effectiveness, um, especially for queries that contain low frequency terms. And just to recap, fast text, as I told you in the word embedding lecture, um, is a subword embedding made of character n-gram compositions, so low frequency terms um, get better representations. And the results for the three models that we looked at today are as follows. So um, especially match pyramid and KNRM suffer if they have small vocabularies and even can get worse um, than the baseline of BM25 if those vocabularies are too small and don't cover enough of the collection. And especially um, if you then use fast text, you get better results overall for all models except for K or M where the results are quite on par. But if you look at low frequency terms, you can see that the um, difference between a full vocabulary and fast text is very strong for infrequent terms that appear less than 20 times in your collection. So in this plot you can see everything that's red means it's better with fast text um, and we plot on the x-axis um, results based on the minimum collection frequency of terms in the query. But the differences become less with higher frequency terms, which I would say is to be expected because fast text and um, word to vec for example, are very similar for high frequency terms. And we can even look at the collection frequency in more detail. So now we're only focusing on CONFCAN or M for queries with a collection frequency of lower than 20. And we can see that here fast text is the only method that consistently improves over the BM25 baseline, even for very low frequency terms. To summarize, so what I want you to take away from this lecture is that we score pairs of query and document full text, but we train with triples and we evaluate listwise. So there's quite a lot of things going on. Then word level match matrices are the core building block of early neural IR models and the environment in which you use this neural IR model, namely the vocabulary and the re-ranking depth, matter a lot. And with that, I thank you for your attention, um, that you watched the video through to the end, and I hope I inspired you for the second exercise and to come back for the next talk where we talk about self-attention. See ya.